Aloha, I'm Dr. Nat Bletter from Madre Chocolate, speaking to you live, well, no, actually recorded from Oahu, and I'm going to be talking to you for the Hawaii Tropical Fruit Growers Conference 2020 about growing cacao and making chocolate in Hawaii, which is a very unique place for, for cacao, as I'll get into. Um, there are many countries, probably over a hundred in the world, that grow cacao and they're generally in this belt that is considered the cacao growing belt of 20 degrees latitude north and south. It's a little narrower than the, than the normal uh, tropic of Cancer and Capricorn. Um, and you can see that right on the border it excludes Hawaii from that, uh, most of Hawaii. And the stars are the about 17 countries that we have received cacao from and made chocolate from, and they all have a very different taste and flavor, which I will get into. So the taste of uh, chocolate from a different region uh, is called the terroir. It's just borrowed from the French word for terrain or land, like terra. Uh, and it is the idea that if you grow the exact same variety of originally grape, like Pinot Noir, if it was grown in France versus Oregon versus California, it would produce a very different tasting wine, even if it was processed exactly the same from the contributions of the soil, the weather, the, the microclimate, etc. And here in red, we see within that 20 degree band, the major cacao exporting countries of the world. It can be grown in a much larger area, but these are the ones who actually export it commercially. And they all have a very different flavor. It can be kind of amazing when you taste chocolate made exactly the same same variety of cacao just grown in different areas so i'll go through some of the major tastes that we see around the world in south america the center of origin of the theobroma cacao gene uh, species we get a lot of variation but generally some nice spicy flavors like cinnamon or nutmeg uh, very floral in some cases deep fruity flavors, and often uh, very nutty or chocolatey flavors. So it has pretty wide range, as you might expect, in the place with the greatest diversity of cacao uh, varieties and, and growing areas. Uh, as we move up into Central America, where cacao was moved probably at least 4,000 years ago, we think, uh, you get a slightly different flavor, often more kind of black olive, almost Kalamata flavors in some of the Mexican cacaos. Uh, touch more astringency from what we've seen from Guatemala and Belize um, and Dominican Republic. And again, those deep chocolatey flavors that we know and love. As we move into the Caribbean, uh, a little more of the nutty flavor and often some dried fruit flavors that a lot of people describe as like black cherry or plum or something. Try and apply these temperate fruit flavors to tropical fruits since most of the chocolate consuming parts of the world are in temperate areas as opposed to the chocolate growing areas of the world which are tropical. Uh, then as we move to West Africa, which is the largest exporting uh, countries in the world for cacao, especially Ivory Coast, Ghana, uh, Togo, Benin, all grow tons and tons and tons of cacao. But they are generally growing a, a more bitter variety, the Forestero that is, is generally a little more bitter, astringent, uh, and nutty, although a lot of the, the flavored differences there come perhaps from the short ferments that they do there. And I'll get into the, how essential the fermentation is to the flavor of the chocolate in a second. Um, in East Africa, 
we see instead a little more mellow chocolate flavors and some nutty flavors coming out of uh, Tanzania, largely. Madagascar has a very um, kind of homogenous flavor, I'd say, of a strong uh, raisin and touch of chocolate. So almost no matter who you buy a Madagascar uh, grown chocolate from, it will have this very familiar flavor of the raisins, which I don't particularly like because I find it a bit monotone, but some people really love. And as we keep going uh, further east to Southeast Asia, uh, where a lot of industrial cacao is grown as well in Malaysia and Indonesia, uh, there is this overwhelming hazelnut flavor. And we've seen some amazing cacaos come out of Sumatra and Sulawesi that tasted almost like Nutella uh, already without adding the hazelnuts because of all the, ha the hazelnut notes in the cacao. So we've been trying to explore some small farm origins from Indonesia. If we then move to Melanesia, Papua New Guinea, where I have worked a lot, uh, it's kind of renowned for this smoke uh, off flavor that gives it a, almost hammy or leathery uh, note because in general, they dry all their cacao over a smoke dryer, which they have borrowed from their um, coconut growing and drying industry. Um, and when we've worked there and done our cacao boot camps there, we try to work with them to build solar dryers, which reveal much more of the underlying nice flavors of the cacao, the more subtle flavors, which are often uh, similar little hazelnut flavors to Southeast Asia and if you get rid of that smoke flavor that kind of overlays everything there's some really nice flavors from Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, and Vanuatu and Papua New Guinea is the largest cacao exporter in the Pacific Islands. Uh, and Hawaii is way way down the list. We are probably the smallest cacao exporting country in the entire world because <laughs> we're not growing a whole lot. Um, then if we move into Australia, uh, you may have remembered uh, when Peter uh, Salas came and talked to us a couple years ago about the Tatura trellising. Um, they are growing some cacao using Tatura tre trellising where he lives in Queensland. Um, and I've tasted a few Australian grown uh, chocolates and they're very interesting, but it's a little too new for me to really generalize the flavor. They, ha they have some nice uh, fruity flavors like Hawaiian cacao uh, because they're at a similar latitude just on the other side of the world. So they're right on that edge of that 20 degree latitude in Queensland uh, in Daintree area. Um, then you see our little set of islands that is just straddling that borderline of the cacao growing regions, 20 degrees latitude. And we generally have a very fruity kind of cinnamon spice terroir, sometimes a little bit of mushroomy flavors if the fermentation isn't done super carefully. Uh, but that is just a generalization. If we zoom in to Hawaii, um, which we call the North Pole of cacao because we can see how it's uh, just on that border. And so one of the coldest places in the world where cacao grows aside from southern Brazil, Cuba, and Australia, and uh, Laos, and some parts of Vietnam and Taiwan might be at a similar latitude. But um, Hawaii is the probably out of all of those places that are far from the equator, we're probably one of the largest growers. So let's zoom into Hawaii and see what the flavors there are like. We've made chocolate from probably over 30 farms in Hawaii now on all the main islands except uh, Ni'ihau, um, and not yet from Lanai, but hoping soon. Gotten a bunch of cacao out to growers there. 
So if we overlay that 20 degree latitude line, we can see that only the bottom three quarters of the Big Island is technically within that cacao growing region. But despite that, it is grown all the way up to Kauai, which perhaps we should call the Pluto of cacao since it's so dang cold. Some people object to the moniker, the North Pole of Cacao, because they feel like it gives Hawaii a bad name, but I feel like it gives it an interesting name to pique everyone's interest. And I say, oh, didn't think you could grow cacao in such a cold region. Um, and some people say oh, it's more due to the, the, the iron-rich uh, volcanic soils that we have here and the um, and the wind and such, and the island microclimate, but um, that is recreated in a couple other places that are not in such a cold area. Um, so we're kind of defying the agronomist view that we shouldn't be able to grow cacao all over Hawaii, but if you're careful about it, you can grow it pretty well uh, in most of the rainier parts, at least, because it does need a lot of water, 60 inches of rain a year and low winds. Um, so, given that broad overview of Hawaii, there are many different flavors within these different microclimates. For instance, we've made chocolate from two farms less than a mile apart, uh, one uh, in Alai, uh, just north of Hilo, uh, that had a very pineapple and black pepper flavor, and then another one uh, a little closer in um, Paukaa that had this amazing uh, cinnamon graham cracker flavor. And we know that those were the same varieties planted there, but despite that, they had this completely different taste, probably because of the microclimates that they were fermented in. In Puna, we've mostly tasted quite earthy chocolates. Um, this might be due partly to some of the difficulty of growing cacao, which has such a deep taproot in the shallow volcanic soils, unless you are lucky enough to be in a little valley where it's built up or you've built up your soil into berms. Um, uh, but it also could be from the fermentation, which is, is fairly difficult when you have a ton of rain constantly during the cacao harvest season and it stays quite cold. Uh, but we're still looking to try other Puna grown chocolates because I think they have a lot of potential and it could be a great growing region. Uh, in Kona, where we get most of our cacao from, from the Likau Kula farm in um, Hololoa at about 1600 feet. So we call that the Alps of the North Pole of cacao uh, since they're so high up. There's some great gooseberry and Brazil nut flavors up there from from that farm. If we go further up into Javi, where they're growing mostly the Criollo variety, uh, so this changes the comparison a bit because Criollo is a very mild and nutty cacao, but they have a solely Criollo farm there, or they did until they uh, put it on the market a couple years ago. Um, it has this incredible amaretto and hazelnut flavor, and this was the first uh, Hawaiian grown cacao to ever win an international award about uh, six or seven years ago from the bar we made. And that farm is up for sale, I think, still. Uh, it's about 120 acres. So if you want to own an award winning cacao farm that's already in production, here's your chance. Um, that is the uh, Heilani Orchards Farm. And we move to Maui, where there hasn't traditionally been a ton of cacao grown, probably because of the focus on upcountry crops and also more of a focus on ranching. Um, there is uh, more of this um, mellow fruit flavors from Hana. Um, and then as we move to Oahu, where I probably have the most experience with different areas just because I live here and I get cacao from a lot of backyard growers in Mauna Willi, uh, which has won a couple awards for the cacao grown there and the Coco of Excellence Award. Um, that's every two years in Paris. 
Uh, they have this great fruity, nutty flavor, and we're trying to get the name of that valley changed to Manawili Wonka Valley instead. <laughs> um, up in Waiahole on the windward side, uh, where cacao grows best, uh, at least on Oahu because of all the rains, uh, you get this incredible Oreo kind of cocoa powder flavor to the chocolate made from there. Uh, just a little bit north in Kahuku, there's this uh, very unique marzipan flavor, kind of bitter almond flavor that goes really nicely with the chocolate. Uh, up in the North Shore in Haleiwa and, um, and in um, uh, Wailua, uh, where another award-winning farm, Nine Fine Minus Farm, is to get these nice peppery cinnamon uh, kind of yeasty flavors. Uh, that have won four awards for the Nine Fine Minas cacao farm there too. And probably the largest cacao farm in all of Oahu that's over 100 acres now is the Dole farm there, um, who is also one, I believe, one of the Coco of Excellence Awards in Paris for some of the top 20 cacaos in the world. So we have about um, three or four uh, cacao farms that have won that prestigious award for being among the top 20 cacaos in the world. Uh, there's Nine Fine Minas, Dole, Monowilly, and Steelgrass was a runner-up last year as well. Uh, we were growing some in Chinatown. Uh, we only had one tree, so it was a little hard to uh, figure out the taste from there. But more recently in Honolulu, I made some great uh, chocolate from my little tenth of an acre uh, in Palolo that had this incredible flavor. So we're going to try to plant more. It tasted like cinnamon and um, and hazelnuts and uh, black currants. So it was possibly one of the best chocolates we've ever made. So I really want to plant more of that. And that was a Criollo one. That was our first ones off of our trees here. Um, up in Kauai, uh, there's a fair amount being grown windward side up to the North Shore. Some of the graduates from our, uh, from our uh, cacao boot camp a few years ago um, in Kapa'a, where Steelgrass Farm and the um, Garden Island chocolate is, have a very kind of brioche flavor to their cacao and chocolate. Um, so that's kind of an overview of the, the different areas of Hawaii. And just like they say, if you don't like the weather in one place in Hawaii, just go over to the next valley 100 yards and it'll be totally different. The same is true with the taste of cacao. So you can really get a lot of variability uh, just depending where you are uh, within the islands and within the valleys. Uh, to give you a better idea of where you can possibly grow cacao well in Hawaii, um, we worked with um, a GIS expert, Lucas Fortini, um, from the Pacific Island Climate Change Cooperative, and he made us these maps uh, given the requirements of temperatures and rainfall, where you could grow cacao on the different islands. And you can see it's largely focused on the windward east side of the islands. Um, and this is with no irrigation at all. Um, so that's a, a little bit minimal, but uh, it's a reasonable amount of acreage. Um, if you add in irrigation, you can see it greatly expands to many places on, um, on the west sides of the islands where it's a little drier. So that really opens up uh, where we could grow cacao. And a lot of this area is already being used by like the Dole Farms and in Kona um, and some places on Kauai and Oahu as well. Um, he also um, did a projection a uh, hundred years into the future with climate change and things drying out uh, with reduction of where we'd be able to grow cacao without irrigation. And you can see it, it kind of shrinks things down a lot from the, oh, let me, sorry, jumping around between the slides too much. 
Um, so this is before climate change, and then this is after climate change. Um, so it's uh, definitely wanna if you want to still be growing in in only eighty years now. I guess we did this a while back. Um, uh, it, you want to pick carefully where you are so you don't have to add a ton of irrigation. Uh, just to give you an idea of the life cycle of cacao and how it grows and how it's turned into chocolate, um, it, it is a coliforous plant, so the flowers and fruit uh, grow out of the trunk, and we think that is both a structural thing and a disperser animal thing because the, um, the branches are not very thick and the pods can get to be sometimes over a pound, so if the these heavy pods, which you can have about uh, 50 of on a mature tree that can only be about 10 feet tall since it's an understory tree, it would bend the branches down to the ground and uh, they would probably rot in the moist rainforest where cacao originated in the Amazon. So one thing is structural and we also think it is due to this disperser, which is the, the agouti rodent, which is about the fifth largest rodent in the world and it is not a good climber like rats are. Um, so we believe that cacao co-evolved with the agouti to put them low to the ground where the agouti could just put its front legs up on the trunk of the tree, pull the fruit down, drag it off into the forest and eat the delicious pulp inside and then spread the seeds all around the forest far from the mother plant with a nice dollop of fertilizer right next to them. So we have giant rodents to thank for the spread of chocolate, at least around the Amazon, which is, I bet, a phrase you never thought you would hear. Um, if you want to know if your cacao is ready to harvest and you're not a goody with such a great sense of smell, you can do what we call the scratch test because these cacao pods, although they look nice and chocolatey, colored are not quite ready for harvest. Um, the, you scratch the skin and they can be, uh, when you see green as in the left, uh, that is not ready to harvest. If there's, if it's orangey colored underneath the skin scratch, it's ready to go. And we made up a little mnemonic slash song uh, to remember this so that you never pick an unripe pod. We say, if there's any green in the scratch, leave the cacao pod for the next batch. If it's orange, yellow, or brown, it's time to take the cacao pod down. And just notice it almost looks like a little smiley face in the scratch there. And they can be all, almost all colors of the rainbow except blue when they're ripe. Um, so there's some that are green, yellow, orange, uh, red, um, even some rare white ones uh, when they're ripe. Uh, usually not uh, so purple when they're ripe. Um, but you can get amazing variation even within one tree or even within uh, offspring of one tree. Um, so from the chocolate maker's point of view, which is how I started getting involved in chocolate, um, the contributing factors to, to cacao flavor are uh, partly from the varieties, the areas that you're growing cacao, um, and so how does that contribute? Is it, is it just the rainfall or is it other factors? So I'll get into that in a second. If you've never seen a ripe uh, cracked open cacao pod, it has this delicious white pulp in it called uh, pulpa de cacao. Um, and when it, it kind of melts off in the ferment, it's called miel de cacao, uh, which in Spanish means honey of the cacao. And it tastes a lot like my probably best descriptor for mainlanders that I use is watermelon Jolly Ranchers. All of you will know guanabana or mangosteen um, or some uh, people liken it to uh, langsat perhaps. Um, but it has a nice tanginess um, that is really reminiscent of, of uh, watermelons. Um, and it generally has a bricks of a between 15 and 22 is the range we've seen on ripe cacao. And when you cut those seeds open, you can see inside, inside is the deep purple cacao seed with all those anthocyanin flavanol antioxidants that we hear so much about giving cacao its health benefits. 
Um, if you want to turn that into delicious tasting chocolate, because they're not so tasty in the raw form, if you've ever eaten a totally raw, uh, unfermented cacao bean, it is fairly medicinally bitter. So it's a two month and 12 step process to get from this to a finished chocolate bar. So all you gotta do is harvest the fruit, uh, which has to be done largely by hand. There's no automation of this and uh, you need to use clippers so you don't damage the flower cushions that it resprouts from every year. Um, crack open the fruit, pull out all that pulp. And then the most important step in my opinion, which I feel adds about three quarters of the flavor to the final chocolate is the ferment. And this removes a lot of the bitterness and adds a lot of the nice uh, fruity, tangy, spice, floral flavors to the final chocolate that you won't pick up in the raw bean. And this is the most complicated food ferment in the world, so I'll get into that in a sec. And it's traditionally done in wood boxes um, in Latin America, covered with banana leaves, stirred every day for about seven to ten days, I'd say. Um, and after those few days of fermenting, uh, all the fruit sloughs off, and that's where you'd collect the miel de cacao from is incredibly delicious in the first few days and then the uh, next few days you can make a nice cacao wine or beer out of it. That should be another value-added product that all the cacao farmers are collecting and freezing or processing into popsicles or cacao wine. Uh, then it gets dried for probably another week or so depending on conditions and you need good good airflow for that which I'll explain in a sec. Um, drying it uh, is kind of the continuation of the ferment during the first few days of drying so it shouldn't be discounted in its con contribution to the flavor and it can be hard to do in Hawaii where the harvest is often coinciding with very rainy periods like in Hamakua and Puna. Uh, then oh, I forgot a step, aging which happens for about six weeks minimum. We've aged some cacao from Vanuatu for three years and it produced amazing chocolate after that. And that kind of reduces the, the acetic acid vinegary notes that crop up during fermentation and definitely mellows it and evens it out. And then when we decide it's ready for the next steps, we'll roast it uh, a lot like coffee, although it's a little bit lower temperature than coffee roasting. And we do it both in convection ovens or this modified uh, coffee roasting drum. Uh, then we'll put the beans through a cracker that we have borrowed from the beer brewing industry called the Krankenstein. Um, that cracks the beans open so we can get that papery shell off the outside of the bean through another machine that totally looks like a Willy Wonka Rube Goldberg gadget. Um, with lots of ducts and tubes and a vacuum that pulls off the lighter shell. So it's a lot like winnowing rice or, or wheat or things like that. Um, then that you get nibs out the bottom of that and cacao shell out the other side and the cacao shell makes a really great uh, super stimulating tea because it has a lot of theobromine and caffeine in it. Um, it has some nice chocolatey notes, and you can serve it ice because it has no fat in it. So we've been uh, going gangbusters with our cacao shell tea recently. Well, when we had f farmer's markets to sell it at <laughs> and sample it at. Um, then if you want to continue turning the cacao nibs into chocolate in a giant industrial factory, it would go through a five-roll refiner, which crushes it to about 20 microns in size so you don't feel the grain anymore. Um, in our shop we use a combination refiner conch with stone wheels like this. Um, this is actually our, our mini test one. We have one that's about 10 si times the size of this um, that can do about 100 uh, pounds of chocolate at a time. And it gets crushed between the stone base and the rollers over two to five days of constantly churning um, and it, it liquefies from the slight bit of heat from friction and turns into uh, cocoa liquor and then we'll add um, a little bit of extra cocoa butter extracted from other batches of cacao 
uh, to get it to grind and temper smoothly. And this is where we'll add sugar and vanilla if we're deciding to. And it'll go for a few days until it's down below 20 microns. So you don't feel that sense of uh, greediness in the chocolate. And then if all that didn't sound so tough, we have the next and hardest stage of chocolate making, which is the tempering. Um, where you get the shine on the chocolate. So if you ever got a bar of chocolate at the store that when you open it up had this kind of like white matte finish that almost looked like mold, that is chocolate that has come out of temper. It was perhaps in temper when it was mailed to Hawaii, but because of the uh, temperature fluctuations in shipping, it may have melted a bit. And it is just the cocoa butter crystals coming to the surface. Uh, it is not bad, but we recommend that you tell all your friends that it's really bad and spoiled and they shouldn't eat it, and then you get to eat it all. So to do tempering, you need less than 50% humidity, which, as you know, is pretty much never in most parts of Hawaii if you don't have climate control. So we have to do this in carefully monitored humidity uh, rooms with air conditioning. Um, and you have to heat it to 120 degrees to melt all the crystals, then cool it to 80 degrees to form all the five kinds of crystals, and then finally melt it to this narrow band between 88 and 91, depending on where it came from and how much cocoa butter is in there. But that's the general range. And there you've only formed the beta-5 crystal of cocoa butter, which is the nice shiny one that we want. Um... So after, and then it gets poured into molds and cooled and demolded and uh, wrapped. And finally, you have a chocolate bar. And if you want to think about what contributes to the final flavor of chocolate, these are some of the, the, the processing stages that you do and, and how they'll change the flavor. So a lot of it that you as growers have control of is the variety that's planted or if you have like a Criollo that has a much milder flavor, it will produce a much sweeter uh, chocolate with the same cocoa butter, uh, cocoa percentage in the final chocolate. And the fermentation, which the grower uh, usually does, we do it for a lot of people if they're not ready to do it themselves and try to teach them how to do it. But if you're doing the fermentation, uh, which has to be done within a week of harvest, uh, that is really contributing the most flavor. It's uh, moves those bitter alkaloids uh, from the bean into the shell, which you're then removing later, and it adds acetic and lactic acid. So it's reducing the bitterness, increasing acidity, increasing umami since it is a fermentation process, um, and increasing the fermented flavor and hopefully reducing astringency that come from tannins in the chocolate. And then all the other stages that the chocolate maker is doing are roasting, cracking, winnowing, refining, conching, tempering, aging. Those are affecting the flavor in other ways, mostly reducing bitterness and acidity um, and changing mouthfeel. But we really feel that what the farmer is doing is, is most of the flavor of chocolate. So to summarize that... Um, the cacao variety uh, and the factors of the macro terroir, so what comes from the soil, fertilizer, climate, wind, rain, sun, temperatures, is really the are some of the biggest contributors to the flavor. But what I feel even more than the macro terroir, what I call micro terroir, or the flavors that develop during fermentation from the microbes in your area, is really what changes the flavor even more. Um, so if you want to know how to ferment well in Hawaii, uh, we have another mnemonic for that. We're fond of making up mnemonics. Um, we call it instead of Hawaii Five-O, Hawaii Five-I. So since we're in the North Pole of cacao, uh, and it can be quite difficult to, to ferment cacao well in these cold temperatures, that Hawaii reaches, there's a few tricks you can do to, to increase your, the, the flavor uh, during fermentation. Um, another factor that hinders good fermentation in Hawaii is that we have such small uh, farms here with so many people with just like backyard farm, uh, cacao trees with like 
know, one to 10 trees. And if you're trying to ferment just, you know, the harvest off of 10 trees together, you're not really reaching critical mass. It's a lot like um, in, in uh, your compost that the larger volume you have, the better it goes. And most people say that uh, you need about a meter squared uh, box of, of wet cacao beans, which is also called baba, to get a good fermentation. And that is not really reached until you have five acres or more to harvest from at a time. So, um, but there's other tricks that I'll explain that can help with that. First is idling. So this is letting the pods sit in a hot place and they dry out a little bit. And that makes the, the really warming um, aerobic bacteria, the acetobacter, uh, a lot happier because it produces air gaps in the, between the beans. And so they'll heat up the ferment a lot better than if, it was, if you immediately, right after harvesting, cracked the pods and put it in the fermenter. It would be just so much uh, liquid in there that it would kind of drown the acetobacter and they can't really heat up the, the batch very effectively. So that's idling for about, you know, two to five days, I'd say. You want to make sure they don't cool off too much from evaporative cooling, so keep them in a relatively hot place so you're start, still starting at a, at a relatively high temperature. The second eye is inoculation, so this means that you're putting actively microbes into the ferment, um, and they can be, or, or you much rather that they come from the local area, uh, from banana leaves or the sides of the cacao pods or from vinegar mother that you've made locally. Um, but we really don't, uh, we need to put some in there uh, to have it go well. They can also be from, you know, like um, Bragg's uh, uh, apple cider vinegar that has the vinegar mother in it can be from yogurt starter, it can be from, you know, bread yeast or sourdough starter that you add. Um, but we liken it to probiotics, that if you don't add any microbes into the ferment, it might go well, but maybe only 50% of the time, whereas if you really pay attention and make sure that you're getting good microbes in there, that it's more likely to go in a good direction about 95 to 100% of the time. Third eye is incubation, so this is making sure that the, the fermentation pile keeps really nice and warm. We want it to get to at least 117 degrees in a good ferment, and um, that can mean doing it in a wind-protected area, sometimes in a cooler or a, a ice, ice a chest, chest freezer that's not plugged in. Um, that can really help uh, uh, both insulate the, the fourth eye and incubate it if you add a light bulb with a little thermostat. We just use a little um, reptile uh, terrarium thermostat to keep the inside of the, of the incubating uh, chest freezer at about 100 to 110 degrees. So we trick the cacao into thinking it's in the middle of the Amazon so it's much happier. Um, and then insulation, I already mentioned, comes from doing it in a cooler to keep it warm, but you still got to make sure you stir it every day so you get good oxygen added back in and keep the airflow. And, and possibly the most important is increased volume, so that's doing larger batches if you can. If you don't have it from your own trees, you could team up with your neighbors and ferment all your cacao together that you're harvested at the same time but keep it in a mesh uh, fruit bag so you can at the end pull out your beans and say, I know these were from my tree and these are from your tree. So you can get the benefits of that added f fermentation volume uh, and still, still know which beans are yours. And you don't have to do all five of these eyes to get a good ferment, but we recommend at least three or four and you'll have things go successfully. So why in the world is this so complicated? Um, it is the, the most complex uh, f food ferment in the world. Uh, I've talked to uh, a fermentation expert at um, Harvard, uh, and she said, you know, beyond any um, 
you know, blue cheese or uh, complex wine fermentation. This is way beyond it because you have uh, not just one or two different species of microbes that are involved and important to the ferment, but you have three entire families. And within those, you have about uh, five to ten species in each of those families. So you have yeasts, which come first, lactobacteria that come second, and then acetobacteria that come first and really responsible for the heating. So, and we're, you know, 50 to 100 years behind wine and beer and cheese fermentation because cacao is usually fermented in the developing world and hasn't been studied until recently. And then it's shipped to the U.S. or Europe to be turned into chocolate and never the twain shall meet. The, the cacao farmer doesn't get to taste the chocolate made from their cacao. And we've tr really tried to change that in Hawaii because Hawaii is the first time in history that we've had cacao farmers right next to chocolate makers like us, right next to research universities like uh, UH that are really uh, collaborating and studying the fermentation process and figuring out how to do it well, especially in a tough place like Hawaii where it's so cold. And once now that we've learned all these good techniques in cold areas, we've gone and taught it all over the world from Dominican Republic to folks from Thailand and Manawatu and really trying to get that technology out there to get better fermented cacao because we feel like you can make any you can make good chocolate from any type of cacao as long as you ferment it uh, really well so i can get a little bit more into the fermentation process um, uh, it is basically the breakdown and addition of compounds by the microbes those three families we talked about it adds aroma acids umami moves the bitter stimulants and mellows the flavor and it requires warm temperatures and inoculants of microbes, either locally or I wouldn't say artificial necessarily, but foreign inoculants. And the microflora that you have represents the terroir of the cacao growing region. So every valley in Hawaii seems to have slightly different microbes, different yeast and acetobacter that are going to land on the cacao. And so that will provide a different flavor. And that's why I call it micro terroir, which is probably more important than macro terroir. Um, the size of your fermentation box is key. You want to make sure it's, um, it's scaled to the amount of cacao that you're doing. So this is some folks from Samoa that we had in the cacao boot camp a few years ago. And they had initially built this, they had really big eyes and they built this giant fermentation box, but then they only had a small harvest and they realized that if they could um, sort of cut off a corner of the box that it could um, help uh, reduce the surface to volume ratio. Because if you think of the surface area, it's, that's all the area that it could cool off. So the perfect shape to ferment in would be a sphere. Well, it's very hard to build a, a spherical wooden box to ferment in, but you can approximate it with a cube. Um, so we want to uh, make sure that you can, you can um, resize your box to fit what you want to do. Um, and you want to assiduously check the temperature too. The more you pay attention to the temperature, the better, because um, then you'll really know what's happening in the whole process. A more advanced style for fermentation is these cascading fermenting boxes. If you have, say, more than a uh, meter cubed, although you can do this for smaller amounts where you set up a tiered system, uh, a bit like a stairwell with a uh, same size box on each level, and then you put it in the top box to start off for a couple days, and then after it's fermented in that, you take off the banana leaves and uh, the, open the door between the two levels and then shovel down from the next, down to the next level where it sits for another day or two and so on and so on down, down the stairs. And in really big cacao farms like this one in Dominican Republic that I consulted with, 
they have about 14 um, sets of these cascading boxes, seven on either side in this entire building, built for just the purpose of fermenting the cacao from their 250-acre farm, which is one farm in the Dominican Republic that is probably more than all of the cacao grown in Hawaii currently. So uh, Dominican Republic is the largest export of cacao in Latin America, um, but you can see hopefully the future of where Hawaii might go uh, in larger scale operations. Um, but despite this and all the planning that went into it, they're having problems with uh, cold wind in their winter harvest coming down through the north-south orientation of their fermenting building and cooling off the cacao too much and uh, producing mold in the boxes, which creates mushroomy tasting chocolate, which of all the strange flavors I've added to chocolate from sun-dried tomatoes to black pepper uh, mushrooms is not a great one, unless they're candy cat mushrooms, which have a nice maple syrup taste. So we figured out how to solve this by adding um, sheet protection to the cloth protection on the both ends so the wind wouldn't rush through the building. Um, so this is a pretty advanced way of doing fermentation. There you see the banana leaves they're using on top. Um, this is kind of the opposite of how you want to go. This is at a farm which I shall not name in Vanuatu where they're fermenting and used uh, coca coconut copra uh, burlap sacks. So they were covered in rancid coconut oil and created a that uh, cacao that had this uh, similar flavor of rancid coconut oil. Very uh, not so good. And they also then smoke dried their cacao. Uh, so we tried to train them to use the wood fermenting boxes that they have there right in the back of the picture or even the five gallon buckets which work pretty well if you're doing small batches. Um, if you're looking for how to inoculate or kickstart your fermentation, you can add, um, these are a couple of inoculants. Sugar is one that is, I kind of lump with inoculants because you put it in at the beginning along with the other inoculants, although it's not technically an inoculant since it is not a microbe, but it is the food for the microbe. So it, it's kind of like a turbocharger or amendment. Um, and you can either use straight uh, sugar if you want, if you can get enough of that, or probably a better alternative is just to add, uh, if you have any excess fairly sweet fruit uh, that doesn't have a super strong flavor, like bananas or papaya, you can sort of mush that up and add that to the uh, fermentation. And we found in blind taste tests that people like the chocolate made uh, from the sugar amended ferments much better and it's it's not a huge amount maybe like one half a cup per gallon of of uh, baba or wet bean for the yeast you can just buy bread yeast from the store or ale yeasts or pinot noir yeast people have kind of used all range of different store-bought yeasts um, but another great place to get your own local yeast, you know, local to your farm, is from the surface of the cacao pod. So we'll often add in a few of the empty cacao pods uh, back uh, point down into the, into the beans when we start the ferment. Um, so you're getting all the natural uh, yeasts and probably bacteria that have landed on the pod. Uh, then, of course, banana leaves, and you want to do the, the underside, the waxy surface facing towards the wet bean, and you'll get both some insulation from that, uh, but also um, some, some inoculation from airborne yeast. Uh, for the lactic acid bacteria, or LAB, part of the inoculant, you can use poi, um, which has lactobacillus in it. You can use homemade... Uh, or live, any live yogurt, uh, natto de coco, if you can get a live version of that, which is like a coconut water kombucha that's made in the Philippines. I have yet to find anyone in Hawaii who's actually has a, a, a starter of that or a mother. 
um, in Solomon Islands, they have something kind of equivalent to poi that they call Makira six-month pudding. So it's like a six-month fermented uh, poi mash or, or kalo mash um, that works good as a, a lactic uh, acid bacteria inoculant. And we always try to find a local version, so we're adding the local flavor and not having the taste of, you know, Dan and yogurt or whatever added in there because we want the local terroir. Um, for the, the acetic acid bacteria, the vinegar bacteria, um, you could get that from either a kombucha mother, which it has both the lactic acid bacteria, or sorry, the acetic acid bacteria plus the yeast. Um, you can get it from Bragg's uh, apple cider vinegar, which uh, usually has the, the live mother, the little sediment at the bottom, if you can strain that out. Um, or you can make your own vinegar mother uh, at home. Uh, just uh, there's a couple instructions I'm sure you can find easily online of how to set out sugar water or fruit mash and collect local uh, acid bacteria from, from the feet of fruit flies. So one reason that fruit flies can be beneficial, at least for cacao fermentation. And often you only need to add these starters on the first ferment of the season and they kind of, you don't scrub your, your fermentation boxes super well um, between each, each ferment if, if it goes well uh, because it's kind of like a sourdough starter that the, that the microbes build up on the, on the side of the walls and they inoculate the next batch. So I often do it in uh, five gallon um, buckets if I don't have enough to fill my wood boxes and those uh, you can get a reasonable build up too but usually the best build up is on wood wood boxes um, for fermentation it's important to do a couple things carefully crack in the pods make sure you keep all your fingers on um, there's a couple easier setups than this one with just using a, a machete or a a knife, you can just crack the pods on a flat surface and they crack pretty easily. About one third down from the stem end is the best. When you pull out or shuck the pods for the beans, uh, you want to be careful to check for germinating beans or, um, or mold. And germinating beans, you'll see where this radical is sticking out, the embryonic root. Uh, on some varieties, it's white. Uh, like Criollo, it's often white. It's a little hard to see because it blends in with the placenta that you see under my pinky on the left. Um, but you'll get used to it. That looks a little uh, more opaque and solid when it's the radical. On some other varieties like Trinitario, it's more of a hot pink. Uh, so it's a little easier to spot in there. Uh, and you can plant these, but if it's already sort of curling over, like you see in some of the seeds on the left here, uh, it is probably going to produce a J-rooted plant, so uh, best not to plant those. The ones on the right that you know still have the radical sticking straight out, those are great candidates for planting, uh, since you don't want to include those in the ferment. It will make the whole ferment quite bitter. And if you see one germinated, bean, I would tend to to get rid of that entire pod because there's probably other ones in there that you, you just aren't spotting. Same is true if you find any mold in the beans when you crack them open, exclude that whole pod from the ferment. Uh, then you want to weigh them, figure out your ratios of inoculants like uh, sugar and the microbes um, that you're adding. And then I try to monitor everything, uh, keep tabs on the temperature, and uh, only when you're really advanced should you experiment with the radioactive glow-in-the-dark cacao, as you see in this picture. No, I'm kidding. That's uh, just the incandescent light bulb that I have in there to act as an incubator. So I have data loggers telling me the temperature and pH of several batches in here. I have the ambient temperature monitored. I have the thermostat for the um, keeping the temperature inside the whole um, cooler. 
at an elevated level of about 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and then I have another thermometer as a backup for the temperature inside the the um, the cooler. And so what's happening during fermentation is first the yeasts are acting in an anaerobic environment, so you don't want air during the first 48 hours of the ferment. And they are consuming the sugars in the cacao fruit. That's why you want to make sure you have a ripe fruit, uh, plus any sugars that you may have added from, from fruit. Um, and they are converting those sugars into ethanol. So on about 24 hours, you'll get uh, ethanol peak. And the temperature will start to rise a bit uh, at this point, but the yeast don't do the bulk of the heating. And then after about 24, 12 to 24 hours, the lactic acid bacteria will start kicking in and they are consuming the ethanol that the yeasts have produced and turning it into lactic acid. So after about 48 hours, uh, maybe a little slower in Hawaii where it's so cool, uh, you'll get a lactic acid peak. And they are doing a little more heating, uh, but they might only get it up to like 105 or 110 or so. Then the real workhorses are the acetic acid bacteria who start uh, hopefully at about 24 hours and are going through five to seven days. And they are also taking the ethanol uh, and converting it into acetic acid in an aerobic environment. And the lactic acid bacteria start out anaerobic but then switch to aerobic um, respiration. Um, and the acetic acid bacteria are really doing the, the bulk of the heating. So we want to try to make them as happy as possible by providing them um, as much ethanol from the yeast as we can. Um, and so you'll get this acetic acid peak after about three days, 72 hours. Um, and you'll get a temperature peak out at about five days, which we want to hit around at least 117 up to like 125 is okay. If you get much hotter than that, you can kind of scorch the whole system and and kill the kill the microbes and and things won't go as far as you want, um, and that uh, once you see the temperature start coming down, that's one of the signs of fermentation being done. Um, you want to try to avoid when the spore formers and molds really kick in. After in Hawaii, that's more like um, eight to twelve days. I usually do. Uh, at least seven days in Hawaii, often up to 10 days, as I don't find that the molds start coming in until much later. Um, but those those can really make your batch taste really funky and even toxic in the case of some okra toxins um, that can come in. Um, and if you do st see molds start forming, if it's only a little bit, you can spray it with some high proof alcohol like Everclear to try to sterilize it and give more fuel to the acetic acid bacteria and hopefully heat it back up. But uh, I would also take out the little bit of mold that you see and to try to keep it from spreading. And if it's all over the cacao, uh, it's probably best to take it out. It's not going to get much better, especially if you're already past day seven. Um, so this is a data logger from Heilani Orchards um, where they um, log their cacao, their Criollo cacao fermentation. Um, and you can see it follows kind of the same form and it reached a peak of 117 degrees. The drop on the right is, I think, when one of the temperature gauges failed. But if you look at the brown line in the background, that's that went to completion of about let's see what was this six six days total um, and you see the temperature started coming down in the last uh, uh, 24 to 36 hours so it's a good sign things are done and these little blips in the middle are um, when they stirred the batch. So that's uh, there was a sudden drop in the temperature and then it starts going back up uh, as soon as you stir it because your 
adding more oxygen to the bacteria and so they can start uh, heating things up again nicely. Now if we overlay that with the graph of the stages, you can see that that lines up pretty well with the temperature peak with the temperature peak at about five days um, and you see when the yeasts are active in the first uh, 48 hours the temperature rises a little bit but it doesn't really start rising till um, day two when the lactic acid and acetic acid bacteria kick in so this is kind of a, a good model of what you'd like to see in a, in a ferment um, so this is just things you can keep track of while you're um, fermenting. Uh, check the smell, the temperature. At about day five, I start tasting stuff and seeing if there's a lower bitterness and astringency. Um, you want to make sure the temperature goes up to at least, uh, sorry, this is in Celsius, 30, 35 degrees in the first few days, 45 degrees eventually. That would be like... Uh, 100 degrees and 117 or so. Um, and when you cut open the beans and day five and onwards, so it's called a cut test, you should see the fissures opening, the colors changing, and uh, you want to stir it every day after 48 hours. So you skip the first uh, day of stirring because it's in the anaerobic stage and then you stir it every 24 hours after that. Um, so what we want to see in a good fermentation is that the color goes from purple in Trinitario or Forestero varieties or white in Criollo varieties to a, a browner or tan color. We want to see the fissures of the, of the bean itself, the cotyledons open up um, so it looks more brainy and less uh, uh, closed up. I want it to go from a yeasty to a lactic acid to acetic acid smell. Um, I want to see a release of juice when you cut the beans. After about day five, you'll see this purple juice kind of squirt out of the beans when you cut them. Uh, temperature uh, falls after initial rise. Sometimes you get some browning on the shell on the outside after the fruit sloughs off and the test taste as I said should go from bitter and astringent to lacking both of those and have a nice uh, sourness. Um, so these are what some of the cut tests look like at day five and this is I was doing a comparison of different uh, fermentation chambers like plastic versus metal and you can see um, Day five, the fissures are fairly closed up, whereas day seven at the bottom, they're starting to open up a little more and the color is less purple. Um, now, moving on to day eight, they're even more open and, and, and browner. Um, this is just tracking some of the temperatures that we see. This is a good representation of the cut tests of different ones, the ones on the top are mostly Trinitario variety and the ones on the bottom are mostly Criollo. Uh, a lot of these I think was only about day four or so, so they're still pretty uh, purple or lilac or white in the case of the Criollo ones. There's a couple in here like the one in the way upper right that's getting brown enough. Um, but uh, so you want to keep track of the cut test to see when things are starting to look good. But since we are making a food out of this, taste is really the final arbiter. So you should definitely taste them after day five and, and get used to knowing when the astringency and bitterness goes away and the acetic acid flavor kicks in. Then fermentation is probably almost as important as drying because you can screw up a really well fermented bean by drying it too quickly or too slowly or letting it get moldy. This is in Chiapas, Mexico where they dry on concrete slabs which is okay in a pinch but it can um, seal the shell or test of the bean too quickly and it locks in a lot of those really strong acetic acid tastes um, and doesn't let them dissipate. So you don't want it to get much over 120 degrees uh, concrete slab drying can be used effectively as they do in Venezuela if you spread them out 
uh, during the day, and then every few hours you gather them back into a, a, a mound. Uh, so it's only it's only uh, heating up for a few hours, and then it's kind of starting the fermentation again. Although that is a lot of labor to like spread them out and put them back together in mounds several times a day. Definitely stirring a bunch helps. Uh, this is uh, in another part of Chapas, um, also on concrete slabs on a roof, which is pretty common there. But what we'd recommend more is raised mesh uh, uh, shelves with uh, covering from the rain. And I'd be careful not to use galvanized mesh because some of that galvanized metal flavor can transfer to the beans a bit. Um, this is at the original Hawaiian chocolate factory where they have these um, little corrugated uh, roofs that they can drop over them if it rains. But probably easier is something like this where it's in a, in a shade house. It can get a lot hotter. These even in rainy hamakua can get up to 120 degrees um, and keep, keep airflow going. And another key thing is to have a gap in the bottom uh, for convection currents to come in and also a gap at the top. So it kind of air comes in the bottom, goes up through the beans, and then as it heats up, it goes out the top. Um, so the main thing we want to do during drying is remove moisture from the fermented cacao um, so that you get down to about 6 to 7% moisture uh, so that the beans will, will break or shatter and not bend. Um, you want to try to stir them uh, fairly often if you can. Um, and you want to do it slowly over five to seven days. Like you don't want to put them in an oven because that's the same as the concrete drying that it will seal the testa um, and not allow the, the evaporation of volatiles like acetic acid. Um, and yeah, just be aware of, you know, the time of year that you're drying. Put it in a windy spot, your drying shed, if you can, and put your uh, fermentation... Uh, in a non-windy spot so it doesn't cool off. So we're working with um, uh, Wailai uh, Orchard in um, Paka'a in the Hamakua coast and they had it reversed. They had their fermentation near their house where it was convenient, which was kind of a windy spot so it was cooling off too much. And then they're doing their fermentation down in the valley where it's a little bit stagnant. And when we reverse those two, it seemed to be a lot better. Um, and make sure you can easily cover, protect the beans from the rain. Um, this is the example from Venezuela, from the famous Chuao area, of Venezuela, which has some of the most revered cacao in the world where you see them piling it up into mounds um, and then spreading it out over the course of the day. Uh, this is in Grenada, um, sorry, Grenada, um, in the Caribbean, um, where they have these uh, roofs on wheels that they can slide over when it starts to rain. Um, it doesn't take too much effort. Uh, lower tech version is just on bamboo with plastic coverings, but that's a fair amount of work. This is probably the best method, and here you can see the gap in the roof and the, the about one to two foot gap in the side so that air can come in. Uh, this is probably the easiest illustration of the roof gap and the bottom gap to allow convection currents. As you can see here too, uh, you can use fishing nets if you're not using them, as long as they're well washed of the fishing smell. Um, this is the smoke drying that they do in in Melanesia that uh, I would definitely not recommend. Um, it can get pretty rickety, and uh, even with the chimney that spouts the the smoke well above the level of the beans, if you have any crack in the in the tube going underneath the beans, you can easily get the smoke flavor in there. And we've had beans in Vanuatu that were not, that were solar dried, but just because they were within like 20 feet of a, of a smoke dryer, they still got that smoke flavor. Um, let's see. 
skip ahead a little bit um, to varieties. Um, uh, a lot of people still might talk about the Forstera group, although that's been split into about 10 varieties, uh, including things like uh, Amazonas, um, Iquitos, Katonga. Um, so this was a genetic uh, phylogeny that was done on cacao uh, about 10 years ago that split, it, split up the whole... Um, species into about 12, 12 varieties. Um, pretty well-known criollo uh, means bread, as in B-R-E-D in Spanish, because it's believed that the Maya may have bred this to take out some of the bitterness. Um, it is one of the rarer forms of cacao. It is much more expensive. A lot of people are really excited about it because it, the beans do sell for more money but it is a lot harder to grow and less productive. So if you think about it in terms of your revenue per acre, revenue per effort, it's probably going to be a wash between that and a Trinitario. Um, so I would recommend Trinitario as a nice productive uh, hybrid variety um, between Upper Amazon Forestero and Criollo. That was probably developed in the... In, or occurred naturally in the 1700s in Trinidad when most of their criollo was wiped out uh, from a storm or fungus. It's still a little unclear. Um, and then they brought in Forestero from the upper Amazon and they hybridized naturally. And it has really great hybrid vigor and the nice productivity of the Forestero group plus the, um, uh, plus the sweeter... Uh, taste of the criollo and Trinitario is the majority of what's grown in Hawaii um, and there are a few ways to tell the pods apart by appearance like um, pencil lines in the valleys on the criollo pods and the bean shape criollo has rounder uh, pods uh, sorry rounder beans um, more spherical rather than almond shaped um, and they're definitely more white inside, but it's really hard to say what variety you have unless you know the exact lineage of it or you get genetic testing. Um, so I definitely recommend as your starter variety Trinitario in Hawaii. Um, if you do want to grow multiple varieties, you would need to keep them at least 300 meters apart so that the pollinating thrip cannot travel between um, uh, the trees and cross pollinate them because you will get, you know, the hybrid in the first round of beans that you're harvesting since we're using uh, reproductive tissue to make the chocolate rather than somatic tissue. Um, so if you can plan your orchard to, to separate by 300 meters of different varieties, yeah, go for it and try both varieties. But uh, if you're just starting out and want to see if you want to get into cacao, I'd say plant like 10 to an uh, acre of Trinitario. And it's fine to start with seedlings. We feel like you can make good cacao out of good chocolate out of any variety as long as you ferment it and cultivate it well. Um, and then if you decide you really like it, you could um, graft over your most productive trees onto your, onto your less productive trees and replace it slowly. Um, let's see, I'll talk about a few of the places that we've gotten cacao from. Hamakua is great with all the rains. Uh, sometimes we call it the Napa Valley of cacao. Uh, Kona is good, but a touch dry for good um, uh, fer fermentation. It's great for drying, so I kind of joke, if, if money were no expense, we'd grow the cacao in Hamakua and then truck it over to Kona for drying. Um, and you kind of have the reverse rain pattern there, so uh, that there is a little bit higher risk of drought. Um, during the winter in Kona for the cacao, which needs such high, high rainfall. Uh, Puna is good in terms of rain, but a little or no soil there, or shallow soil makes it a bit difficult. Um, I want to warn everybody that there, there is the original Hershey's cacao field near the 
um, KL uh, High School, but it has a really virulent strain of black pod uh, mold there. So please do not go there and collect cacao pods to plant out because you will spread that virulent mold uh, to other cacao farms, uh, including yours, and um, several cacao uh, orchards in Hamakua have had to be cut down and restarted because the black pod got so bad from spreading from uh, people going to the KL field and then bringing it to to their own or orchards. Um, I mentioned Javi, which is great with all the nice rain there too. Oh, sorry, I was forgetting pictures. This is Jini Chibua uh, in Kona and Hololoa at uh, Likaukula Orchards. She ferments in wine barrels and gets amazing flavors. She's won, I think, about six awards for her cacao and the chocolate that we make from it. Um, there's Hawaiian Crown in uh, just north of Hilo. There's the Hart family at Wailai Orchards in Paka'a, Hamakua. Colin and Pat Hart with their harvest. Uh, there's Ginny again. And J since Ginny was at about 1,600 feet, uh, she's one of the highest altitude places in, in Hawaii that we get cacao from aside from Una Greenaway and Captain Cook at about 2,000 feet. So since it gets so cold up there, Ginny said it's gone below freezing a couple of times over the um, about 12 years she's been growing cacao. Um, so she built a, a greenhouse not to grow cacao, but to ferment it properly. Um, so you see she has the wine barrels on the left, and she even covers those in mylar, and then she has a... Um, venting uh, uh, windows at the top there that can cool it off if it gets too hot, but that's not too often. And then she's drying uh, in these raised mesh shelves on the right there. Um, and she does the wine barrels because um, she originally thought they would be easy to stir. She could just put them on this axis and spin it, but it seemed like it glommed up too much and got stuck together. Um, so she stirs it with a paddle. I thought I had a picture of her with a paddle. Um, let's see. Where did it go? I don't know. Disappeared. Um, oh, there she is with her paddle to stir the cacao. Um, all right. Who else? There's more of her drying sheds. There's Mary Dowling at Heilani Orchards in Javi with her Criollo Farm. That's won lots of awards. Um, and then if we uh, move on to Maui, there's folks like Hana Gold um, over in, in Hana, of course, where they have plentiful, plentiful rain, so they get a really nice harvest. Um, there are some people on the North Shore in like Haiku uh, trying to grow cacao, but it's a little bit windy there with all the wind coming down off of Haleakala. Um, so Maui doesn't have a ton of cacao farms yet. There's a couple of people starting in Kihei as well. Um, over on Kauai, Kapa'a seems to be the most pop popular place, and Hanalei a little bit. Um, can be a touch cold for good fermentation. This is Hana Gold, where I've gone to work with them on their fermentation eight years ago now. Um, and they seem to have automated uh, automated uh, picking with their, their puppy there, who helps them with finding all the ripest pods. Uh, then there's Tailgrass Farm over in Kauai. You can see the different colors that you might get on one single tree. On Oahu, we have the North Shore where the largest cacao farms are grown, but it is quite hot and windy up there, so definitely needs added irrigation. We have the largest, some of the largest farms, uh, Dole and Lonohana. Um, Waiaholi on the windward side, 
Perhaps we can call this the Sonoma County of Cacao if Hamakua claims the title of Napa Valley of Cacao. Uh, there's four or five growers at least in Small Valley. Um, and just right near there, there is um, Kualo Ranch who started to grow several acres of cacao. Uh, great rains from the valley. <coughs> but in some of those areas, they're off the grid, so can make uh, incubated fermentation a little bit difficult. And somebody suggested there might be a genetic bottleneck with some of the trees in Waihole all being planted from one parent tree. Um, and then Kuhuku Farms up a little further north, uh, they're still kind of technically on windward side, but they're a little drier and only about 20 feet from the ocean. Um, but they have a really interesting marzipan flavor to their cacao. This is Lonahana. This is the Rapun Farm in Waihole. Kahuku Farm in Laie. And there's a couple for small farms in Haula, Oahu, Molokai, Lanai. are still waiting on. So, in my opinion, in conclusion, I think that uh, fermentation is probably the greatest factor in the Hawaiian terroir in fermenting in these small batches in little valleys where you get uh, very particular yeast and bacteria that fuel the ferment um, as long as it's not a really strong tasting uh, or different variety like Criollo. Um, so we found that if you take the same cacao and ferment it differently um, in different places, you can get quite different flavors. And conversely, you could get the a similar taste if you ferment different cacaos in similar areas with the, with the same inoculants. So if you'd like to learn more when we have our... Um, cacao boot camp starting up again when we can all go out. Um, like to invite you on that. Uh, who knows when it'll be. We usually like to do it in January, March, or June when there's a lot of cacao pods and it's the entire, we call it seed to tree to bean to bar uh, cacao uh, cultivation, harvesting, processing, and chocolate making. So teaching chocolate makers how to grow and ferment and teaching cacao farmers how to make chocolate so we can all speak the same language. Um, and um, hopefully can continue the science and study of cacao varieties and grafting and fermentation. Um, uh, so you could, for instance, see if you can inoculate Hawaiian grown cacao with Venezuelan microbes to get some of that chihuahua flavor that makes it so famous, or vice versa. Um, and also if we sort of did the same exact fermentation with like lab incubators and inoculation, then we can maybe taste more of the macro terroir uh, that comes from the growing regions and see if if there's uh, more uh, uh, re regional differences in the land. Um, and uh, you can always get in touch with me at info at madrechocolate.com if you want more info or any questions or if you want us to help you ferment. Um, oh, one thing I forgot to mention is that... Uh, Grafting cacao is possible if you want to get, you know, one field all with the same exact variety that you really like. Um, it is a little bit harder than most species that I've tried to graft. So I'd say it's a little bit harder than a mango, um, maybe less hard than an avocado in my experience to graft. Um, and I've mainly been successful with uh, clef crafts and um, micrographs on very young seedlings. Seems to 
help them along a bit and definitely keeping it in a misting chamber out of wind since cacao is so sensitive to wind. So hope you enjoyed that. I hope uh, y'all start growing cacao and those of you that are growing send me some samples of your beans or cacao to ferment. Okay thanks so much and pass it on to whoever's next in line. <laughs>